what is now the sensitivity of a detector? We are looking at all these parameters. So we define sensitivity as the charge that is produced per incident X-ray quantum at a specified energy because the sensitivity can be different at different energies. And therefore, I mean, if you have detectors that are sensitive to different energies, you could actually overlap them. So what is the dynamic range? So that again is a ratio where X max is the X-ray fluence producing the maximum signal. X noise is the fluence producing a signal equivalent to the quadrature sum of the detector noise and the X-ray quantum noise. Basically, the dynamic range depends on the smallest thing that you can detect, which is typically the noise. And what we do is we try to equate the RMS noise of the signal to the RMS noise of the least significant bit of the A to D converter. Then you have an optimum system. Let's talk about MTF. So essentially, the concept of MTF actually is a description of the resolution properties of an imaging system described in terms of the ability to produce images of sinusoidally varying test objects of various frequencies. These are sinusoidally varying objects. And uh, many times we do it with different slits that uh, have distances or we even do it with edges because we, it's in the transform domain. So essentially what we have is your n sub x and delta n sine kx where k is the angular spatial frequency which is related to the fre frequency with the term 2 pi, you know. It's very, it's related to the spatial frequency. The contrast associated with the sinusoidal waveform as we define it is delta n, which is the height of the sinusoid above the mean, divided by the mean. That's what we just, so we have things called the contrast transfer functions as well. We have n sub in going into an imaging system that gives us n sub out. So you have n sub out is a constant multiplied by n bar, which is the DC part of it, and the MTF as a function of k multiplied by delta n multiplied by sine k of x and the phase. So the factor MTF k modifying the magnitude of the output signal, we call it the MTF and it's the ratio of the output to input contrast as a function of the spatial frequency k. Okay, and obviously there is a difference between linear and angular frequency and everybody I'm sure knows about it. So physical objects can be represented uh, as a weighted sum of spatial frequency components. It's, a, it's actually a 2D Fourier transform uh, representation. Could also be a wavelet transform, people do that. It depends on the transform space that you choose to work in. See, because M sub K varies with K, obviously you will generate a distorted version of the actual object because some of the high frequencies may be attenuated. And so therefore you need to have a system MTF that is compatible with the task at hand or the exam that you're doing. Now, for example, if you're looking at lung nodules, you need to make sure that you have a few line pairs per millimeter in order to visualize the nodules. And then on the other hand, if you're looking at microcalcifications, you need a larger MTF. So essentially, this is another view of MTF uh, related to the optical transfer function. Basically, if you look at it, if you have T U comma V normalized by T zero zero, which is the uh, optical transmission transmitted by the uh, system, gives you another view of the MTF. This is from optics for people who like to relate it to optics. An ideal device, if you have, is a perfect photon counter. So your signal to noise ratio is the number of photons divided by the number, square root 
of the number of photons which is the noise. So that is n mean square root of n mean so n measured is signal to noise ratio square of the measure. So typically noise is not really Poisson distributed you know and detectors unless they are photon counting detectors are photon integrated detectors. So it gets modified so it is less than the signal to noise ratio. So we have a term called n prime which is called the noise equivalent counter and this was a tough thing initially when I was exposed to it about 20 years ago at Kodak for somebody who is used to electrical engineering terms this was counterintuitive you know this is this is almost like one over the signal to noise ratio. It's the number of quanta that would produce the signal to noise ratio non-ideal in an ideal system okay. So if it's less quanta that produce the signal to noise ratio it's less but you know a higher signal to noise ratio means less noise equal equal and quanta so it can be a little confusing. And so the ratio of the noise equivalent quanta and the actual number of incident photons is called the detective quantum efficiency. It's called the DQE, it's the fraction of photons contributing to a measured result. To give you an example, in a screen foam system, you get a QE of 35 to 40 percent. That means only 35 to 40 percent of the X-ray photons that hit the screen film system are converted to light photons okay and the uh, QE of film is even quite low it's about 4 to 5 percent actually film doesn't have very high QE. So a little bit about the electronics I mean uh, I will try to make it uh, as intuitive as possible. So essentially what happens is you have this is the representation of the photodiode this is an equivalent circuit and you have this is the pixel capacitor the TFT switch and you could have a bunch of these things I showed 2000 of them I mean there should be 2000 of them I could not show 2000 of them naturally. Then you have things uh, in terms of crosstalk from other columns you have the column capacitance and then we have a thing called a correlated double sampler that I'll talk about which actually came from charge couple devices uh, you know that technology you have a multi multiplexer and a anti-aliasing filter and an A to D converter. So let's discuss these components very quickly. So each of these components has attributes which are the dynamic range you have noise actually it's interesting um, electrical engineers like to talk in terms of volts and RMS noise and physicists like electrons. In fact it took me a while to be comfortable with electrons now I'm comfortable with both because I used to deal with a lot of physicists and they never understood what I was talking about and I had to basically translate noise and as we know the noise is bandwidth dependent. So in the next few slides we'll look at a 2000 by 2000 array uh, with a 14 bit conversion and see how the signal and noise propagate okay. These numbers are examples these are not exact numbers but they are representative of what you see in a digital radiography chain. Let's look at noise in a time invariant system. So if a signal with spectrum S sub S F is applied to a LTI system with a transfer function of H sub X then the output spectrum obviously is given by its you know S Y F is S X F times the square magnitude square of the transfer function as a function of frequency. This is a well known relationship. So let's look at the photodiode and the storage capacitor. Let's take a look at the bias voltage of 5 volts. Typically what happens is when the electrons this is I've showed in I've shown this thing as if the uh, charge is positive but usually what happens is the bias is extinguished in the diode. So it may be negative charge but for the purpose of explanation it doesn't matter. So let's say the initial noise is 500 electrons 
or 80 microvolts RMS. So let's say the signal level is 4 volts. This is a fairly intense system for a dynamic range of 50,000 to 1. So let's say the on resistance of the TFT is about 3 mega ohms. And I took an off to on ratio of um, 10 raised to minus 5 or 10 raised to minus 6. Actually, these days we try to get to 10 raised to minus 7 and 10 raised to minus 8. And the leakage is about uh, 10 femtoamps. Because the leakage is also important because it charges the pixel capacitor. And then you have, you know, the control input, which is VCN, and then you have drain to gate capacitance and gate to source capacitance. These things actually inject charge when you move the control inputs. So charge injection due to these capacitance this can be about two tenths of a volt. So essentially you need high dynamic range so that you can subtract out these constant factors because essentially the signal can be about 12 and a half to 13 and a half uh, bits. So there is a thing called KTC noise and it can be proven and it is there in textbooks of electronics. So when a switch is open, there's always noise accumulated. That's called Q square is KTC, where K is the Boltzmann constant, T is the Kelvin temperature, and C is the charge. So C is the capacitance. So essentially, if you visualize it, voltage square is KT over C. And this noise is independent of the resistance of the switch. It's a simple proof. It can be found in any book on communication theory or microelectronics. So column capacitance can be 50 to 100 picofarads. The larger, the longer a column is, the larger the capacitance. And so crosstalk capacitance between columns can be a few hundred femtofarads. So I represent it as this. So now here's the thing. Where does this column capacitance come into the picture? You got this 0.5 picofarads here. And then you have 50 picofarads. These are two impedances into an op amp. So the noise gain of this op amp is 1 plus Zf over Z sub i. And uh, so essentially, the noise gain for the op amp is related to the column capacitance. So any noise gain here is going to be amplified. So it's one of the biggest sources of electronic noise in the system. And um, you need about 10 time constants or 3 microseconds to completely charge an integrating capacitor to 15-bit accuracy, okay? So the noise is integrated in 3 microseconds, and it's about 1,000 electrons. And each of these amplifiers deals with 128 columns for an available ASIC. So I took a very pristine amplifier that has got 2 nanovolts per square root hertz. But actually, in practice, it's not that low because we can't run these amplifiers at very high currents. It's more like 14 to 20 nanovolts per root hertz. So you see the effect of the column noise is even more severe. So essentially, in terms of the operation of the system, you reset it. The pixel capacitance is reset to a reference voltage. And then you integrate it. The signal charge is accumulated on the pixel capacitance. Then, in the readout, the signal charge is transferred to an external charge, charge amplifier, and then you convert it. If you look at what happens is, if you start counting all these electrons here, you get 1,500 electrons of random noise, that is 800 electrons of KTC, and then 256, 25,000 electrons of signal, and then you got an offset. So you have total voltage of 8 volts, signal, uh, signal 0.4 volts offset, and 66 nanovolts due to KTC. And then you also have 1 over F noise of amorphous silicon transistors that are quite high. So in correlated double sampling, what you do is a sample is taken with the TFT Q1 off, and immediately, another is taken with the TFT on. So the 1 over F noise is removed because you do it fairly quickly. And then you also eliminate the noise due to the reset of the amplifier. But what happens is, because you have an extra amplifier, your square root of 2 
times the RMS noise, but it turns out that this is still an advantage. You have total voltage is 8 volts, 0 0.4 volts of offset, 32 nanovolts due to KTC, 80 nanovolts square, squared noise and no 1 over F noise. So we use these, and these are actually within the chip itself. Each one of them has a correlated double sampler. And then let's assume 14 bits with a 10 volt range. And so the quantization noise of a bit is sigma square over 12. That is 31 nanovolts. And so if you normalize the gain to 1.2, basically the total RMS noise is the square root of the expression in the parenthesis of 398 microvolts. This is less than 610 microvolts, which is the step size of the A to D. This is an ideal case. In a true situation, that's not the case. You know, but then you're taking away some of the dynamic range, like 800 counts of this 14-bit converter go away in terms of offsets. And I'm not address crosstalks here. That can be done. So these are the timing assumptions. So you have a total time of converting a pixel as 3.6 microseconds. So if you take 2,000 pixels per column and 128 channel ASIC, it's 920 milliseconds if you have a single A to D converter for that. So the only way to improve this timing is to have multiple charge amplifiers per ASIC or have multiple converters. And that is done. And that becomes expensive. So typically, to give you an idea, uh, the raw cost of a panel uh, may be about $10,000. The cost of the electronics is another four. And then there are markups. So high performance charge amplifiers are necessary to maintain signal to noise ratios. The on resistance of the TFT has to be reduced. But in order to reduce the on resistance of the TFT, you need larger length to width um, larger widths. And then if you do that, you're taking away the fill factor. But these days we have three-dimensional structures, uh, but you're also increasing the leakage current. So it is actually a balance of all these factors. And these are the things that I struggle with when I design a system as to what the right balance is. And that's where a lot of my time is spent. And that is the reason for my gray hair. Let's look at this. This is actually some examples courtesy of Robarts Research Center in London, Ontario, Canada. There you extract organs from a 3D abdominal CT image. So if you look at it, one is the vertebrae, two are the ribs. I've numbered all these. I'm not going to read these. You can read these. And this is a volume view. So how do you do this? Okay, You do bone segmentation. And actually, this is in the purview of segmentation. You extract the bones, you separate the spine from the ribs, then you find the 12th rib, which uh, is a reference. Then you find the vertebra connected to the 12th rib, and then you set the center of gravity of the vertebra as the reference point, which is the origin of the coordinate system. Now, what happens is then you have a pattern spectrum and you do a size analysis. And if you look over here, basically, you find them clustered very nicely. Stomach, of course, is misspelled. I didn't do this slide. What you do is you have a before and an after. You actually um, you do some processing here, which I won't go into details. And what I want to show is if you have four regions here that you have cutting regions, you show these cutting regions in 3D. Uh, a lot of it is also used for image-guided surgery. And then you have a histogram. Then you start thresholding these things, applying functional transforms. And then you get a result here. And this is highly sophisticated. It's a threshold segmentation, but you have to find the right threshold. Because you see, you see two peaks here in the histogram. Sometimes it's not that cut and dry. It's Easier to do this on cadavers than real people. And so the same thing, I mean, you use for the people who are into image processing, 
you use things like uh, recursive erosion, geodesic influence, and region sinking to get all the seeds, and then you recover the separated organs. Um, actually, there are a lot of handbooks on this. I can recommend you to some of these things for those who are interested after this is done, but I'm just giving a smattering and an example of what is being done. And then you have an organ recognition, but what do you have to do? You do a feature analysis in terms of size and position. You match the database or dictionary because there's no such thing as a standard organ. You have an atlas of different organs that actually is also culturally different, you know. You have atlases for organs from people from Asia or Japan, also the European organs. They're, they're very different. If you don't have these atlases, you can get uh, false recognition. And you label the objects with a unique symbol, a number or an anatomic name. So that's an example of that. Now we talked about display of images. Okay, coming back to the display of images. Today, all images are typically, if they're not displayed on film, are displayed on LCD monitors. They used to be displayed on CRT monitors, but there's not a single CRT monitor that's used in medical imaging. Today, you have medical displays that go anywhere from 5 megapixels to 9 megapixels. And one of the big things, before I talk about those things, let's talk about what, is the, what are the factors that you need for such displays. You need to have sufficient spatial resolution because it's not good enough to have good spatial resolution in a dis detector in order for that image to be aliased by a display system because the display system can alias it as well. You need sufficient dynamic range, which is bit depth. You know, you need to, the ability to view pathologies. And by the way, early displays had a problem because they didn't have sufficient dynamic range and when people did studies of radiologists, a typical radiologist was able to read a normal screen film in 28 seconds and say next. Now they can do that, that fast today with other transformations. But in the early days of windowing and leveling about 10 years ago, it took about two minutes to do the same thing on a display. And time is money. And so obviously you couldn't do that and productivity is very important and you need sufficient sharpness and frequency response. And you don't want a displayed image to create a pathology. I know I put all these things in order to inject some humor, but uh, this is a little more than humorous when it comes to some of the situations in the States where uh, basically uh, even companies can be sued. For example, as a, if I manage a project in a company and let's say I do something that causes injury or death, I can be hauled in the court along with the CEO of my company. Um, and the display should be bright enough and large enough to view against normal lighting conditions. What I mean normal lighting is not this lighting. This is normal lighting in a radiologist suite because there's a little bit of darkness, but it's not so dark that it puts people to sleep and it causes so much of eye fatigue. And the other thing with displays too is the angle of viewing displays. Been a lot of studies in medical conferences where at a 45 degree angle the display looks terrible. And today there are displays that use, um, that are coming up with organic LEDs. That's again a Kodak invention where the LEDs are right on top and it's isotropic with angle. The advantage is a bunch of people can view the same case and see the same image in order to get opinions. So let's go with a few concepts, but this is a highly simplified thing. Because if you want to look at the contrast sensitivity of the human eye, the seminal book on that is by Barton's. Uh, called Contrast Sensitivity of the Human Eye. I think it was written in the early 2000 uh, by B Bartens, or it's Barton, B-A-R-T-E-N, and you can Google it and find it. 
uh, the contrast sensitivity has been studied in terms of various factors. But this is an early study of contrast sensitivity. In the luminance space, you know, if you have an object and it's around, the contours between the rectangles will not be visible if you have delta L over L less than 0 0.012. That translates in the density space, optical density, as 0 0.005D. And why is this important? Let's say you digitize something, as we will see, with incorrect digitization, you can actually create contours. And what happens is, if these contours are obvious, you know, people can discern the difference between what you say, anatomy and a contour. Of course, it's an ugly looking image. But then in certain screening exams, like mammography or any other screening exam, this false contour can be mistaken for a pathology, which is not good. So I'm just talking about in terms of the digitization. Let's take a single linear A to D converter to digitize luminant data from 0.1 optical density to an optical density of four. Actually, you'd see such a thing in a mammogram because in mammograms, you want to see the skin lines as well as the microcalcifications that are fairly dense. It's a very high dynamic range. And um, also the exposure is very high in mammography, but it's at a lower KEV. So how many bits, okay? So essentially, if I were using a linear A to D converter, you know, the, these calculations show that I would need the smallest step in a converter to be about a million. So this would have, this could not be a 16-bit converter. This has to be a converter of 20 bits, and that's quite impossible at the speeds that we are talking about. So, but you could use a log amp before the converter. If you use a log amp, today we don't use log amps because there are other issues. Uh, you could use a 10-bit converter or you could use overlapping converters and do some curve fitting. See, and these calculations are also valid when you're digitizing film, where you're taking luminance and converting it to density in an imaging system. And why is that important? Because some of the early mammography computer-aided detection algorithms, as we'll talk about, used to digitize screen films there's still systems like that, and do try to find micro calcifications or speculations or, you know, extra ductal carcinomas, which are important. So, LCD monitors, as I said earlier, are being used to display medical images. And newer monitors have a resolution of 9 megapixels. And we talked about off-axis viewing, and management of imaging, images on these monitors is quite a problem. Because what people like to do is to like to look at a whole bunch of images. In the screen film situation, you have a thing called alternators, where people put a whole bunch of films, and they, you move racks of film up and down. That's a very high bandwidth. So what today people do is with fast storage, they stage these images before a radiologist goes and looks at it. So you can look at it fast. But this was an issue until a few years ago before you had large bandwidth systems. So this is a typical system. It's a Kodak system, which is a 7,500 digital radiography system. And it's a $750,000 system. That's not why it's called 7,500. But this system typically has a big detector here. It's got an x-ray source. It's got a table and, and under the table bucky where you could put other detectors. And uh, this detector moves up and down. This is a Cadillac of a system. And it uses a, a cesium iodide scintillator. Um, it's a panel made by a company called Trixel that's quite common. So what are the advances in digital radiography? 
retrofitable DR. See, today what happens in an existing digital radiography, people have to replace a complete room. You have to have the right type of generator, to have the right detector. By the time you replace the room, it's a $750,000 system. Now today, digital radiography systems are coming where you can retrofit it into existing rooms because there are about 50,000 conventional rooms still around in the United States. And, to, uh, and so people are interested in retrofitting at least half these rooms with retrofitable detectors. The other is the portable DR, whereas you take a detector and put it under a patient. And then you can do a portable exam, like in an ICU. But these things have to be quite rugged because bariatric patients or patients who are very heavy can be about 350 pounds. And the requirements for these detectors are that a 350 pound patient should be able to stand on the center and not break it. And notice it's a glass detector, so you've got to put a lot of stuff around it. And then the new paradigms we'll talk about is uh, tomosynthesis and cone beam CT. So, tomosynthesis, this is a very recent advance. A lot of it came out of Mass General Hospital. And uh, it talks about image visualization. It is about image visualization in mammography. It uses CT reconstruction techniques to reduce anatomical noise. Let's talk about anatomical noise. Before that, when you take an organ such as the breast, okay, it's compressed, but you can only compress it to a certain point. But what happens is when the x-rays are moving down, there are layers of anatomy that interact with others, and that's the image that you get. And you got a small microcalcification or a speculated lesion. And you can't see that many times because anatomy that has nothing to do with this blurs this. So that's called an anatomical noise. And that was one of the early reasons why there wasn't a difference between screen film systems and digital radiography systems, even though these were more efficient. So what was done by this fellow Nicholson, who is with this company, Hologic, he was at Mass General. Uh, this is the breast here. So he took X-ray images by moving the source around the detector. So in CT, you do reconstruction techniques that are based on equations that have to do with sums of linear attenuation coefficients. But we do it a little differently. So you shift the images to select planes, and then you create tomograms. And this is what happens. These are early images. These are a lot better today. This was the original image. And you look at the tomoplane one here. You see, you hardly see anything here. Tomoplane two, three, and see here, there is, here you see some microcalcifications that are very, very visible. But what happened, see in uh, mammography, people use typically two views. There's a craniocardial view that's from head to toe and the medial, medial lateral view. And people were thinking until recently that because you had uh, tomosynthesis, that one view was sufficient. But it turns out that recently there were papers at RSNA that showed that if uh, you had a lesion that was perpendicular, you couldn't see it. And also, you needed to see axillary, uh, the axillary fossa, because you, a lot of uh, infiltration of cancers occurs over there. So it turns out that you do need both views in tomosynthesis. But the advantage of this is use the same amount of dose. You use less dose for each projection in order to get the total integrated dose, which is about the same as a mammogram with a, a CC and an MLO view. The only thing here is it takes more time in terms of compression. So one has to worry about the comfort of the patient. So this is a recent picture, which actually showed 
a false positive in mammography. This was a conventional digital image. And um, basically, this is an MLO view because you see the, the structure. And also, in mammography, it's very important to come very close to the skin line. That is not there in other detectors. It makes it complicated in terms of detector. So if you look at it, this looked very suspicious. But if we looked at the tomosynthesis image, this is, an, this is normal anatomy, and it's not malignant. And this was borrowed from Hologic uh, recently. So let's talk about another advance. It's called cone beam CT. And it's, got, it's also an advance in mammography. So here is a, this is from uh, uh, Ning in University of Rochester. And he took, uh, he just modified a CT scanner and instead of standard CT detectors, he took a flat panel. This is a digital radiography detector that can go from, go at high speed. It's a 4030 CB detector from Variant medical systems that can take 30 frames a second it was designed for fluoroscopy. And if you look at this, you take a mouse and uh, you look at the mammary tumor, you can actually visualize it in a very pristine way because you have these elements, these detector elements, coming very close to each other. This was some early work by Dr. Ning. And then today you put cone beam CTs on a C arm. And if you are in an operating theater or in a surgery suite, you can actually, for image-guided surgery, you rotate the C-arm and you can get a 3D reconstruction and you can do placement of images of, uh, let's say, needles or biopsies or other things uh, very accurately. It's very important in brain surgery and neurosurgery uh, that uh, in image guided surgery uh, so that you don't damage uh, anatomy that you're not supposed to damage. And this is another, uh, this is by Dr. Sewardson of Princess Margaret Hospital in Toronto where he did, uh, he came up with a system that looked at a cadaver head. That was a previous thing that you saw. Now, the, a later development, this is the latest development Cone beam CT for mammography, what's happened is the patient is lying here and, the, and uh, the breast is here as a pendant. And then here's a flat panel detector. Here's a x-ray source and it rotates around the patient. And so you can do a CT of the breast. And this doesn't involve compression, but it's immobilization. But the interesting thing here is the source here is a tungsten source. It's not a molybdenum source, which is used in. So this actually, uh, Dr. Ning started a company called uh, Koning. Don't know how he got this name, but. And this is uh, a system that's going to come out in a year and a half. It's a cone beam syst system for mammography. You do one breast at a time at a time where the breast is in this cavity and this is the cone beam system on the inside. It's a 10 second scan for breast. And whereas you can get, uh, you can actually see lesions because that are otherwise obscured by anatomical noise because this is a true CT scan. Yes, in vis-a-vis -a, -vis a standard CT a flat panel CT, you get some scatter because the scatter reduction, you got to have a grid, and you can put a grid here that is an angular grid because it's a cone beam. But typically, scatter is not such a big issue. We try to remove that in uh, pre processing and post processing. And CAD for mammography CAD is computer ass assisted detection. Originally, what was done was we had screen film systems where the film was digitized and then detection was performed using CAD algorithms and today there are quite a few algorithms. And FFDM, by the way, is full field digital mammography system, okay? That is the 
uh, what I mean by FFDM, I did not expand that. And uh, today you find actually CAD is efficacious for detection of microcalcifications, but it's not efficacious for other things. But then its sensitivity for microcalcifications is quite high, 98%. And for masses, it's about 84%. And for masses with microcalcifications, it's 92%. It's a good uh, pre-screening thing or even a post-diagnosis you know, diagnosis thing to see whether you miss something. And uh, it is still a very hot field. And uh, a lot of work is being done on it. And there's a lot of uh, controversy surrounding mammography with recent studies on it, uh, basically depending on whether somebody had dense press or non-dense press, and this is an ongoing controversy in terms of what's efficacious. So, let's see what else can be done in, uh, with systems. Okay, this can, um, for example, there are certain things in medical imaging where PET, phlogiston emission tomography, what gives you physiological information. And then anatomical information comes from MR or CT. And really, uh, this is a single photon emission tomography. It's nothing but a rotating gamma camera. And so you register these, and then you get a nice image, which is an MR per, per, plus spec image, where you're getting anatomy as well as physiology. If you go to Tata Cancer Hospital, they have a PET CT. And uh, which is a PET scanner and CT on the same gantry. And whereas you see an extracranial study of the thorax, where the top row is a PET image, the bottom row shows MR with a contour, and the middle row shows image registration using MR and PET. People have been doing this with CT, but people are doing it with MR as well. And if you want to detect PET CT, uh, detecting lung cancer, the left top is a PET image of the thorax. The right top shows the X-ray CT scan of the same. The bottom image are because of registered images. And actually, the X-ray images that come out of the CT are used to correct for the attenuation in the PET scan as well. We won't go into that at the moment. I had, and I gave a talk last year over here in July. I did spend some time talking about it. Okay, 3D medical imaging in telemedicine. Today you have high speed broadband. Okay, and um, what has happened is there's a company called Terror Recon, which has come up with a board that finds itself in Philips and Siemens systems where you could take 2D CT or MR scans processed in a centralized server and you get a 3D model. You get visualizations, you get surfaces, and then you take the 3D image, you can actually segment the image before you send it, or you can do it later, and you send it by broadband to doctors at remote sites, and then you see it's an asymmetric processing, so it takes less time to actually look at the image than to create it. And then you can look at it with laptops. That's been happening, and this is, these are some images from the latest RSNA. What are the benefits? We talked about better patient visualization provides better and faster diagnosis, and it saves on film costs. Today, you don't need film except sometimes for people to archive, and you may not need that either if you can archive things in a redundant fashion. And um, basically, you don't have mail latency and travel time. And uh, I can see in the future, and I will talk about, I'll spend the rest of the time after the talk in terms of the opportunities that are available in India in terms of 3D. 
Now, I can presumably see once we start having faster connections or even reasonable connections that some of these images are sent overnight and staged and the diagnosis could be done offshore. The time is coming. So, this is the end of my formal talk.